Between 2001 and 2003, Brooke Burgess released a Flash animated series called Broken Saints, a tale of four strangers from across the globe who come together through visions of looming doom, sending them on a journey that will have them confronting various philosophical, religious, and political ideas. The animation style used still images with minor effects and text and word balloons shifting in and out, accompanied by music and, in later releases, voiceovers. It was effectively an animated comic book, and is considered by some to be the first of the motion comic format. While Broken Saints was a completely original work, the format was soon adopted for tie-in media for films like Saw, Inception, or Dread, and of course adaptations of pre-existing comic books. Making big blockbuster superhero films is great and all, but tweening some minor animations into a pre-existing image is quicker, easier, and cheaper. And nobody can complain we're straying from the source material. Any problems with the stories are problems with the original comics. It's a win-win. There is a certain capitalist aftertaste when it comes to these kind of motion comics, large corporations getting a few more drops out of the superhero boom of the 21st century. However, it wouldn't be honest to pretend that this was anything new even if Wikipedia lists Broken Saints as the beginning of this trend. The distribution is new, sure, online distribution allows for these products to get to the target audience more directly, but lightly animating comic book panels has been around for decades. Meet a sulky, over bulky, kinda hulky superhero, a two-fisted and electrically transistored superhero, an exotically erotic and aquatic superhero, the Marvel superheroes have arrived. In 1966, we had the Marvel Superheroes, an anthology series that photocopied contemporary Marvel comics such as Captain America, The Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, the Mighty Thor, and the Submariner, and animated their mouths and eyes and maybe the occasional limb while keeping the rest of the image static. It was cheap, but it also brought the artwork of Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, and Don Heck into your living room. This was later abandoned for original productions using comic book properties, but animation in the 60s was usually so cheap looking you might not have noticed the difference. Which brings us to 1977 and the launch of Cube. As we previously discussed, Cube had to produce 10 channels worth of original content all at once. A lot of hours of television had to be made quickly, and the cheaper, the better. Now, it had some advantages, one of them being that Cube was owned and run by Warner Communications, and Warner Communications also owned DC Comics. You can probably see where this is going. This is a real stumper, Hawkman. Every room is tightly locked each night, the corridor's full of guards. Hmm, and yet you say, Commissioner, that this mystery thief comes and goes as he pleases unseen. The show Cube ended up producing was Video Comics, or Video Comic Books. I've seen it listed both ways. I'm not sure if there is a title change at some point, or if some places listed the show incorrectly, but Video Comics I'm 100% sure they use at some point, so that's the name I'll be using for the rest of this video. Video Comics was an even simpler affair than the Marvel superheroes, simply photocopying whole comic book panels and putting them on screen. No character animations at all. The panels were instead flourished with pans, zooms, dramatic transitions, and the occasional white frames to simulate lightning. The real draw here was the voice work, music, and sound effects, giving these stories some symphonic life. Theoretically, yes, but I wouldn't want you to quote me. I hate to be proven wrong. But if we're right, larger quantities of our chemical will be used to create gardens out of sweltering deserts, and that is definitely worth the effort. Well, can I quote you now? The compound worked better than... Uh oh, Matt Cable at the door. Well, we better let him in, Linda. Dr. Holland, uh, my name is Ferret. My associates and I would like a word with you if we could. From the footage that's available, it would appear the show used a stable of three voice actors, two men and one woman. But with only two episodes made public thanks to the wonders of YouTube, there's no way to say if that was consistent for the show's entire run. In any case, what you effectively end up with is a book on tape playing over comic book panels that you watch on your television. And of all the incarnations of the motion comic we've talked about in this video, it does seem to have the cheapest production values. Even more so than its Marvel cousin 11 years prior. In fairness, though, we are looking at it from the perspective of 40 years in the future. 
One person with a decent computer and basic video editing software can create their own version of video comics pretty quickly. Here, I'll show you. Young blood, time to meet your new field leader, Shaft. Proper introductions are in order. Let's begin with Vogue, ex-Russian gymnast, expert in martial arts and all hand-to-hand -hand combat. A player as well as a looker. Hello. Next up we have Die Hard, a very own government-issued metahuman. This is an updated model. Power level ranks at a 10, strength, speed, stamina, the whole nine yards, the ultimate weapon. Sir? But you know what? They didn't have Photoshop or a seven-year-old version of Sony Vegas back in 1977. You were doing things by hand, and to get something even this simple out quickly required a production team of, uh, wow, 17 people, plus audio production happening at Owl Studios, a local Columbus establishment built out of an old stagecoach station, which isn't important, but I like whimsy local trivia like that. Eight-hour recording sessions at Owl Studios cost $175. I just have a Yeti mic and a free copy of Audacity. Video comics was super cheap TV, but it's easy to forget how much harder even cheap TV was back then. As for the rest of the staff, it appears they didn't do much outside of Cube. Except maybe this guy, Bill Burnett. This could be the same Bill Burnett who would go on to be the story editor of early Cartoon Network shows like Cow and Chicken, as well as creating the Nickelodeon show Chalk Zone. I can't confirm that though. Video Comics is listed on his IMDb page, but IMDb is basically a glorified wiki. It could very easily be two Bill Burnett's. 70 segments were made for video comics, ranging from 10 to 20 minutes, the idea being that they could be shuffled to create thousands of combinations. These segments also included ones that did not have voiceovers, the idea being that kids could read the comic panels for themselves, which was passed off as an educational element for the program. Hey, we're getting kids to read. Reading off the television. Get right up to the screen, kids. Yeah, I know sitting too close to TV doesn't actually hurt your eyes like your mama told you it would, but it's not the best look for a show. It's hilarious that a show that's basically a camera pointed at comic books even tried to pass itself off as educational and wholesome entertainment. Not dissing on comic books here, just, you know, that really wasn't their goal. Video Comics had access to the DC Comics library, but didn't do any episodes on the A-listers. There's no episodes for Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman. I think the biggest star they managed to adapt was Green Lantern. The reason for that is unknown, but if I had to speculate, television broadcast rights for certain characters were claimed by other productions. By 1977, there were already well-known Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman television shows, but you know, no Green Lantern show. That's just a theory, of course. Other comics they adapted included Swamp Thing, Hawkman, Space Ranger, The Flash, The Atom, and some children's comedy series like Sugar and Spike, the misadventures of two little toddlers who can communicate through baby talk that adults don't understand. Think of it as a 1950s version of Rugrats. But really, how did we get here? How did a small experimental cable package get access to the majority of the DC Comics library for their silly filler show? Yes, they were both owned by Warner Communications, but how did that happen? And how did Cube and DC end up meeting? Two words. Parking garages. Okay, maybe you need a bit more than that. Four words. Mob-owned parking garages. Kids, buckle up, because the story of Warner Communications is kind of nuts. So, let's jump back 50 years or so to the days of Prohibition, where this man, Abner Longies Willman, is that right? Zwilman? He was making it big smuggling alcohol in New Jersey. To store the contraband he was importing from Canada, Zwilman would lease parking garages owned by his friend Manny Kimmel. It was a strong racket, and over time Zwilman would become known as the Al Capone of New Jersey. With the rise of the automobile industry and lack of parking for apartment renters in large cities, parking lots and garages were gradually becoming a large industry. And once Prohibition had come to an end, Kimmel and Zwilman used the foundation they had built to form an official parking business, the Kinney Parking Company, named after Kinney Street in Newark, New Jersey. Not that I'm terribly interested in presenting organized crime in a redemptive light, 
but by some accounts, Zwillman was interested in expanding into legitimate businesses, and in fact promoted going legit to other crime bosses at various crime boss get-togethers. Mob conventions, basically. The Comic-Con of its day. And let's be clear, Zwillman himself never went legit. It was all, do what I say, not what I do. So Kimmel and Zwillman started to buy out other businesses to build up the Kinney Parking Company brand. One such business was the largest funeral company in the United States, Riverside Memorial Chapel, which was run by the founder's son-in-law, Steve Ross. Remember him? The guy who stayed in the Japanese hotel and got the idea for Cube? It's all starting to come together. Now, Zwillman did not get to see this purchase go public in 1961 because he had sort of probably maybe gotten himself murdered. In 1957, the U.S. Senate created a committee to investigate criminal influence in labor management relations. Zwillman had been issued a subpoena to testify before the committee, but on February 27, 1959, a few days before he was set to appear, Zwillman was found hung in his home. It was ruled suicide. Also, he had bruising around his wrists that suggested he had been bound by a rope, so, you know, probably not. Theories abound as to what actually happened, but when you got a guy who for years preached organized crime going legit, and he was about to approach a committee dedicated to sniffing out organized crime, it's easy to build your own narrative. So let's go back to Steve Ross. He had a car rental business on the side that was also picked up by the Kinney Parking Company, and with more acquisitions, the more he found himself in charge of things, until eventually Ross was just made company president. This conglomerate company went public in 1962 under the new name, Kinney National Services. Ross started to become interested not just in manufacturing and service industries, but entertainment industries. In 1967, Kinney acquired the Ashley Famous Hollywood Talent Agency, the motion picture equipment company Panavision, and most importantly for this video, National Periodical Publications, aka DC Comics. So that just leaves the Warner part of the equation. I'll spare you the history of Warner Brothers for now. We'll be returning to their legacy a handful of times throughout knickknacks. But in the late 60s, the company was not doing well. It had nearly gone under in the 1950s, and co-founder and president Jack Warner was advancing in age and looking to pass control over to someone else. He ended up selling his controlling stock to distributor Seven Art Publications, and the company became Warner Brothers Seven Arts. In swept Kinney National Services, buying up the company for $64 million in 1969, who reverted Warner Brothers back to its old name. And that's how Warner Brothers and DC Comics became siblings, a relationship that they still profit from to this day, for better or for worse. Save Martha! Now just because the company's mobster founder was gone did not mean the company was free of scandal. Back on the parking garage side of things, the company was being accused of price fixing. In 1972, in order to keep this scandal from harming certain operations, Kinney decided to break into two large separate companies. One with all the non-entertainment assets, which became National Kinney Corporation, and one with the entertainment assets such as Warner Brothers and DC Comics. This became Warner Communications. This way, the scandal would deflect to the more boring technical company, and Steve Ross would ride on the fumes of Bugs Bunny and Superman. And that brings us up to speed. Ross went to Japan, came back, and made Cube, and allowed them to put up a bunch of DC comics on the small screen. And when Nickelodeon went live in 1979, video comics was brought over to fill some of its time slots. This technically means Video Comics is Nickelodeon's first imported show. It's even listed as such in Wikipedia, but that feels a bit disingenuous. Nickelodeon was an extension of Cube under the same company. Video Comics is as much an imported show as, say, a show going from ESPN 1 to ESPN 2 would be. And really, it has nothing to do with Nickelodeon's practices of importing programs from Canada, Britain, and Japan throughout the 1980s. Video Comics ran until 1981. It was always a filler program, a stand-in until the station had enough quote-unquote real shows, and as such didn't really seem to quite fit in with Nick 1979. For one, every other show in Nickelodeon's starting lineup was personality-based, with hosts and characters for kids to get attached to. The characters on Pinwheel and Hocus Focus, Josie on By the Way, John Mishita Jr. on Nickelflix, Randy Hamilton on America Goes Bananas. These are people you're meant to have an audience relationship with. Video comics was just disembodied voices, and trust me, it's harder for disembodied voices to catch an audience. 
And then there's tone. Unless I've greatly misinterpreted what By The Way was all about, Video Comics was the only 79th show that had moments of genuine darkness, depending on what comic they were covering that day. One episode they did was on Swamp Thing number 1, which offered the very violent and very bleak origins of its titular character. I wonder why they... Oh my dear God, that thing is ticking! Gotta try to defuse it before... Imagine pain, so intense it defies description, as countless unclassified chemicals seep deep into throbbing, fume-enveloped flesh. Oh my God! Oh my dear, dear God! Imagine what such terrible suffering can do to the fragile mind as it drives the stricken body forward, clawing desperately at the cool night air in hopes of some small comfort. Imagine relief as the smoldering man-shape reaches the soothing waters of the ever-present bog, then disappears soundlessly beneath its bubbling surface. Yikes, right? I'm not saying kids can't handle dark subject matters like this, but it was the only show on Nickelodeon like this at the time. A man's flesh burning off in video comics was nestled in between plus and minus telling jokes on pinwheel and freestyle frisbee demonstrations on America Goes Bananas. It just didn't feel like it had a place here, so it was gone after two years. Video comics is the definition of a footnote show. A simple, cheap work meant to fill airspace, a byproduct of a crazy, crime-filled corporate history and an early, lesser example of a medium that wouldn't really take off for another 25 years. There's two segments of the show available on YouTube, two of 70, totaling 30 minutes of footage, but this is a rare time I'm just not all that upset about how much of the show is lost. Even if we never discover another second of video comics, every single comic book they adapted is readily available and easy to find. You don't need this show to experience Swamp Thing's origin story. And you know what? You don't need the motion comic to experience Watchmen or Batman or anything else. These stories have a perfect platform already. So, you know, get comfy on the couch, turn on some ambient music, and read some goddamn comic books. Nick, 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 Next time on Nick Knacks, we try to reach the youth of America with contests, celebrity appearances, and, uh, the Jonestown Massacre? What? Am I reading that right? Jonestown. For, for real. Alright. Well, that's the next official episode of Nick Knacks, but first, we're going out of chronological order for a special episode that's a, a bit more fitting for the Halloween season. Stay tuned for that. And just a reminder, Nick Knacks Episode 5 is being postponed. Again, I promise it's for a very good reason that'll make the episode better. I can't wait to get it done. Today's shout-out goes to Master of the Game, Steve Ross and the Creation of Time Warner by Connie Brook. This is mostly a critical biography of the Warner Communications CEO, but it does have some juicy details about how the business was run, including all that mob stuff. If the abridged version I give in this video intrigues you, it might be worth a look. If you'd like to support Nick Knacks and the Pop Arena, perhaps consider donating to my Patreon. The more I make there, the better I can make this show. Also, the longer I can go without having to get a real job again. But hey, there's other ways you can help out. Liking the video helps bump it up in the YouTube algorithm. Sharing the video will help get the word across. And subscribing will keep you up to date on everything Pop Arena. Also, consider following my Twitter account, at pop underscore arena. That's where you can keep the most up-to-date on the state of upcoming videos, and sometimes I retweet funny things, who knows? But as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.